Hello, and welcome to Warhammer 40K's Grim History from the Beyond. I'm Zekthar. And I'm Yuxin. And we are the chroniclers of all that was, and all that will be in the 41st millennium. We've seen the rise and fall of many empires, yet this month we will be going fast, because we'll be discussing the White Scars. Indeed, we will be getting back to our usual one-month program. This month we will discuss speed, as well as some notable characters and the great Khan himself. That's right, but before we start, if you like our stuff, feel free to follow, like, comment, and subscribe. And if you really like our boxes, feel free to join our membership program, like Sir Bender Bynton, our very first member. Quite right, brother. And thank you to our newest member, Hermes Skirty. Well, what are we going to talk about today, Zekdar? <clears throat> well, this week, Yuxin, it's all about speed. Ah, yes. How can we talk about the White Scars without talking about their vehicles? But brother, before we discuss some of the more fun vehicles, perhaps I give a brief concept on how White Scars use this speed to wage war. Sounds great, brother. But before we start, I got a question from Commander Purple YT. And he says, hello, guys. I have a question and was wondering if you think what could stand up to all the orcs uniting under Gazgul Threka. I was also wondering if you could do a Gazgul episode. Interesting. But as you know, brother, we answer questions at the end of the month. I honestly don't think we have time to answer this today. True. Very true, brother. But I figured this was a good time to let people know we are still doing a Q&A at the end of each month. But real quick, to answer your question about an episode on Gosgul. Yes, we actually have that in the workings, but not for a while. Indeed, brother. Little known to our audience, but we plan this stuff way ahead of time. And we plan to do Gosgul along with Yark and some others when we discuss Armageddon. But unfortunately, we will not be covering that until January. Right. I know that is a ways away, Commander Purple, but take heart. We will answer the first part of your question at the end of the month. There is no way I'm letting a question about orcs wait that long. Also, keep in mind, we will be covering Armageddon like we did the Horus Heresy in a special two-month-long endeavor. Indeed. But to return to the White Scars, brother, the stage is yours. Well, the method of war taught to the steppe tribes of Chagoras by Jagatai Khan has served the White Scars well in the many millennia that followed. Their modus operandi consists of lightning-fast hit-and-run attacks conducted by high-mobile forces, destroying the enemy piece by piece and never allowing the enemy to force a decisive or stack engagement, evoking the mounted warrior's of their heritage, each brotherhood maintains a high proportion of assault bikes, attack bikes, and land speeders, and their infantry squads are almost always borne to battle by fast-moving vehicles or gunships. Indeed, it is often said that the White Scars are born in the saddle and are not at ease unless fighting on, in, or from an armored mount of some kind. They also make use of jump pack equipped assault squads and scepters, to harass the enemy and then hit the foe with the full assault when they are at their weakest and most frazzled. Although preferring to keep the foe at arm's length, the White Scars are fully capable of engaging in bloody close assaults and are rightly feared by the enemies of the Imperium. Also, the majority of heavy weapons normally used by Space Marine forces such as the Heavy Bolter, Missile Launcher, Plasma Gun, or Heavy Flamer are frowned upon by the chapter, and any main battle tank that cannot keep up with the rest of the army is avoided in the order of combat. Now these doctrine are the general standards, but do not apply across all aspects of the chapter. Really? How so? Some of the companies, or more specifically two in particular, fall outside of this purview of style. Uh, two companies? You're, you're not going to talk about two entire companies, are you? Oh, don't worry, brother. I'm, I'm just going to mention how they differ. I'm not going into a deep dive. Oh, well, that's good. I don't think we got the time. Remember, we're supposed to be speed. Right. All right. Go ahead. Let's start with the sixth company, known as the Hoxai Brotherhood. Okay. They use an interesting method of having transports followed by predators, repulsor executioners, and vindicators. 
While the transports create a wedge, the predators form hunting squadrons and pull around the flanks as the following executioners and vindicators continue going forward and act as an anvil, the company's foe shall be broken upon. Now, the ninth company, or Stormbolt Brotherhood, is made up of fire support squads. This company is the one that applies defensive and static combat tactics. As such, it wouldn't be strange to see them utilizing heavier weapons than other companies. Overall, the White Scars are considered a powerful and effective chapter when undertaking direct, rapid assaults or carrying out surgical strikes intended to achieve specific operation objectives. On the other hand, the White Scars are not a chapter that would fare well undertaking sieges or forcing them to utilize static combat. All right, brother, let's hear about the Harleys. I mean, er... I mean, bikes. <laughs> now, the assault bike, also known as the Space Marine bike, is a light vehicle that is used throughout the Imperium by most Adeptus Astartes chapters, yet none use the vehicles more than the White Scars. The White Scars, who are recruited from Chagoras, are taken from the savage horse riders of the steppes, and thus the entire chapter is already adept at mounted warfare. The ship between mounted attacks from horseback to zipping across the battlefield on war motorcycles is fairly easy for most White Scars, so the deployment of assault bikes is almost a constant stratagem in the chapter's military engagements. The assault bike is an extremely powerful machine and is capable of propelling a fully armored space marine at dizzying speeds while remaining responsive enough to perform a full range of death-defying combat maneuvers. There are tales of experienced space marine bikers who have driven their bikes through solid rockcrete walls at full speed without harm. Don't ask me how. I, I, I don't know. But apparently they did. <clears throat> Anyways, assault bikes usually operate in bike squads of up to eight and are used for fast-moving assault missions, intelligence gathering, infiltration, and general reconnaissance. When assault bikers are used for assault missions, they will attack the enemy at incredible speeds, using both surprise and unstoppable momentum to rip through the enemy formations. Before the enemy can regroup and go on the defensive, the Astartes bikes will turn around and attack once again from an unexpected direction. In order for Space Marine bikers to use their mechanical steeds at maximum efficiency, they must function flawlessly as one. And to this end, the Codex Astartes dictates that all assault marines, scouts, and the entire sixth company of the chapter must master the art of mounted warfare as part of their training regimen. There are several chapters that take this further, with every space marine in the chapter being required to maintain his mounted training, even if the space marine has long since passed into the ranks of the chapter's first company. There is no Astartes chapter that better exemplifies this philosophy than the White Scars, who proudly employ assault bike squads as the main body of their strike forces. Like the spear hurled from the hunter's hand, the White Scars punch through the enemy's defenses to pierce the heart and deliver a death blow. Mounted upon their mechanical steeds, the White Scars roar into battle. The snarls of their bike's engines is like the growling of a hunting beast, while the hammer of their bolters rings the death knell for foes beyond number. The White Scars do not simply mount headlong charges against the odds. Though they might appear tribal and barbaric to outsiders, every space marine in the White Scars chapter possesses a deep-rooted pragmatism and a predator's cunning. When they strike, the White Scars are like a storm, their speed that of the howling wind, their strength that of the sky-shattering thunderbolt. Yet they always strive to ensure that the enemy have been scouted, their strength gauged, and their measure taken before battle begins. Now, getting back to the assault bike, along with the attack bike variant, they have been used by the Adeptus Astartes since the dawn of the Imperium. The Space Marine legions that fought during the Great Crusade maintained entire companies of assault bikes as part of their legion outrider squads for lightning-fast attacks on their enemies. Their vehicles were deployed during the Horus Heresy by both Loyalists and Traitor Legions alike. During the Siege of Terra, the White Scars Legion and their expert use of assault and attack bikes helped keep the Traitor Legions away from the walls of the Imperial Palace. And after the walls were breached, they were successful in capturing the Lionsgate Starport and denied the Traitors many of their reinforcements. I, I believe you uh, discussed this actually last week, did you not, Yuxin? And actually the week before that, when we did the Siege of Terra. Yes. Yes, I did. <laughs> Probably one of their crowning achievements of the Siege of Terra. But anyways, regardless. 
Following the death of the Ark Trader Horus, the Trader Legions made a hasty retreat from Terra into the Eye of Terror, all the while being harried from world to world by the White Scar's bike squads. The standard assault bike used by the White Scars are armed with twin link. <laughs> uh, I just keep thinking because they're called bikes. I just see these White Scars pedaling as fast as they can anyways down a mountainside. <laughs> we got this! Pedal, man! Pedal faster! <laughs> Sorry. As you know, they're really actually motorcycles. But I just had that funny image. Anyways. <clears throat> The standard assault bike used by the White Scars are armed with twin link bolters that are attached to the bike's forward armor cowling, fixed to fire in the direction of travel. The sheer amount of bolter shells that can be brought to bear at whatever target that might stand in the way is often enough to make the enemy break and run before the bike has even reached them. While the assault bike itself is only lightly armored by most adept to start his vehicle standards, the vehicle's real firepower comes from its rider, who is always equipped with frag grenades, it can also employ crack grenades. The rider is usually also equipped with a bolt pistol and a chain sword, and can optionally make use of flamers, grav guns, melted guns, and plasma guns. Now, during the Great Crusade and the Horus Heresy eras of the late 30th and 31st millennium, assault bikes could be equipped with weapons that are no longer commonly used by the Adeptus Astartes in the late 41st millennium, such as twin link flamers. Actually, real quick, Euxin, I would I would imagine probably the salamanders still use those on their bikes, yes? Um, I, I don't see the salamanders using many bikes to begin with. True, but it wouldn't shock me if they had twin link flamers on their bikes. That yeah. just sounds like something they would do. <clears throat> but anyways, twin linked melta guns and twin linked plasma guns used in place of the standard twin link bolters. Now, speaking of the early times of the Greek Crusade and the Horus Heresy. There was a second type of bike that the White Scars liked to tootle around on, and they were called jet bikes. Um, brother, do mm -hmm. you think we have time to go into jet bikes? I mean, they are not really used anymore by the Imperium because the Mechanicus lost the technology on how the anti-grav fields for the jet bike worked. True, true. And normally I would agree with you, but they're making a comeback, thanks to Belisaurus Cowl. Really? Indeed. The old curmudgeon has begun tinkering with the grab drives, and it is only a matter of time before they're zipping around the battlefield again. Well, make it quick. I want to talk about the land speeders. <laughs> yes, well, a jet bike is a fast and highly maneuverable vehicle that is powered by advanced anti-gravitic technology that allows it to hover above any surface while being propelled by powerful jet engines. These sleek vehicles can be used to carry a passenger into the air above the maelstrom of battle, or to carry out missions like reconnaissance or hit-and-run attacks that require a high degree of speed and mobility. There were several different patterns of jet bikes used by the Imperium Man over the centuries, and the most common patterns are usually armed with some type of anti-personnel weapon, such as a heavy bolter, or a set of twin link bolters that are synchronized to fire simultaneously. These weapons can lay down a withering hail of fire against lightly armored targets. Now, while we can't go through all the different patterns of jet bikes, I believe two are worth discussing because they were favorites of the White Scars. The first is called a Bullock Pattern Jet Bike and was the last known pattern of jet bike produced by the Imperium of Man before the outbreak of the Horus Heresy. The Bullock Pattern first saw use shortly before the outbreak of the Horus Heresy, and many of the Bullock Pattern Jet Bikes that had been produced at the time were in the possession of the White Scars Legion. It is known that during the White Scar's campaign of extermination against the remnants of the Orc Empire of Overlord Urlak Uruk, who had been conquered by the Emperor of Mankind and Horus during the Ulanor Crusade, the 5th Legion had no less than 500 Bullock Pattern jet bikes in its possession. The Bullock Pattern jet bike was armed with a single spinal mounted heavy bolter, although it is highly probable that the Bullock Pattern jet bike could also be armed with different weapons, much like other jet bike patterns. And the second variation was called a Sojitsu Pattern Void Bike, and was an early prototype Imperial jet bike that predates the more common scimitar jet bike that was in common use with the Legion of Astartes during the Great Crusade and Horus Heresy eras. During the initial trials, its thrusters were capable of providing sufficient thrust to grant the bike limited periods of true flight, and even some maneuverability in deep space. And it was classed by the Logistica Imperialis as an ultralight fighter craft instead of a jet bike. 
That's interesting, Zektar, but why do you want to bring this one up? It doesn't seem to have anything to do with the white. It is said that the Sojitsu Void Bite was the favored mount of Jagatai Khan. Ah. Well, that's all I got about bikes. Tell us a little about the Land Speeders, brother. Ah, yes, the Land Speeder. The Land Speeder's origins date back to the first century of the Great Crusade. When techno archaeologist Arkan Land led several expeditions into the uncharted, extremely dangerous depths of the Librarius Omnids on Mars. During these expeditions, Land rediscovered the standard template construct, SDC, designs for two heavy tracked vehicles. The first was the Mighty Bell Tank, which would later be known as the Land Raider. And the second was the humble utility vehicle called the Land Crawler. Land also discovered information regarding the powerful and compact plates capable of emitting an anti-gravitic field. And Land later developed theories on their uses. Eventually, this knowledge brought about Imperial anti-grav technology. Although clunky when compared to Xenos anti-gravity engines, the Imperium has made great use of Land's discovery, most notably in the Land Speeder that bears his name, and the <clears throat> new Imperial Grav tanks like Primaris Space Marines Repulsor that has recently been brought into service by the genius of Archmagos Dominus Belisarius Call. Uh, pardon me, Yuxin. Just, just Eddie. So I want to make sure that I got this right. They're called Land Speeders after this dude? Yes. Huh. See, I always figured they were called land speeders because they zipped around, you know, just above the land. Yeah. Along with some of these other things like land crawlers because they crawled across the land or land raiders because, you know, they're they're Terran based. But it's actually because of this one guy. Yep. Huh. It's interesting. Well, just real quick. Anyways, what happened to him? Do you know? Um, Sometime after the siege of Terra, he ended up making another expedition and disappeared due to a psychic entity ah. of unknown origin. So I bet he's making anti-gravitic stuff for the Drukhari now or somebody anyway, it's in the warp. Well, like they would need help with that? Uh, I don't know. Maybe. They already maybe. have advanced anti-gravity <laughs> engines. Why on earth would they go, oh yeah, we need you to work on anti-gravity stuff. Well, maybe he helped out with, like, the tanks or something. You know, they're not really known for tanks, but... <clears throat> so, sorry, I just thought that was actually fairly interesting. I just always figured it was because all these vehicles were, like, terrain-based vehicles or terrain-based vehicles, but it's actually named after this one dude. It's kind of interesting, but... Sorry, C carry on, sir. I, I believe you were talking about Belisarius Call, your favorite person. No, I'm moving past that. Oh, Okay. <laughs> We're moving on to the land speeders. We aren't going into the repulsors. Gotcha. Okay. Land speeders can accomplish a variety of battlefield objectives, ranging from recon and scout deployments to tank hunting or other seek and destroy missions. The space marine land speeder often acts as a mobile reserve vehicle, dashing forwards to exploit weaknesses in the enemy line or bolstering the space marine's attack wherever they most need it. The lightly armored, the land speeders are heavily armed and versatile, able to carry devastating anti infantry or anti tank firepower. The land speeder tornado is more heavily armed still, equipped with an additional chin mounted heavy weapon to bolster its role as a mobile firebase. The land speeder typhoon is another common variant, mounting a formidable missile launcher battery in addition to its crew manned heavy weapon to break up enemy troops and vehicle formations from a distance. All of the chapter space marines are trained to fight as land speeder crew during their service and close support squads. But the craft are usually piloted by the most daring of all, those who truly embrace the high speeds of which a land speeder is capable. Land speeder pilots think nothing of skimming close to the contour of the land. Threading between jagged rock spires, jinking through forests, or performing abrupt nose dives and barrel rolls to avoid incoming weapons fire. Considering the incredible mental and physical strain of achieving such bewildering maneuvers at maximum speeds, 
The fact that few land speeders are lost to pilot error can be solely attributed to the superhuman reflexes, training, and stamina of the space marines who crew them. The land speeder's main feature is its powerful anti-gravitic field emitting ventral plates that allow the vehicle to move without touching the ground and to glide if drops from orbit or off of a high structure. How these plates work is a mystery to all but the most senior and high-ranking members of the Adeptus Mechanicus. It is believed that mankind once made a wider use of the anti-gravity technology Jet bikes! <clears throat> oh, jet bikes! Like the Eldari during the Dark Age of Technology, yet in the 41st millennium it is almost a lost art. While the Xenos Eldari and Tau make use of far superior anti-gravitic technology, it is forbidden for any magos of the machine cults to study these devices, and any caught doing so usually receive the harshest sanctions. Other than Belisarius Call, right? Probably. Mm-hmm. Well, what popped in my head is like, but if you're a magos that isn't from the machine cult, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, there ain't a, f- a whole lot of them left, is there, in the Imperium? <laughs> they kind of get weeded out. <laughs> That's all right. Carry on, sir. The anti-gravitic plates of the land speeders are positioned around the vehicle's nose and cockpit. And when they are activated, they create a powerful inverse gravitic field, which is repulsed by natural gravitic forces and thus pushes the vehicle upwards. The vehicle is given forward motion by a set of afterburning ramjets positioned on the rear of the land speeder. Land speeder is equipped with small stabilizer wings on its side. The land spear's anti-gravitic plates may be powerful, but they can only support approximately four tons, and thus the land speeder is only equipped with light armor. In truth, the power armor worn by the vehicle's crew usually provides better protection from enemy fire. The standard land speeder is used as a fast scouting and recon vehicle, and as such is only lightly armed and armored. The land speeder is armed with a single pencil-mounted heavy bolter that is operated by the vehicle's gunner. The heavy bolter can be switched out for a multi milta to give the land spear better anti armor firepower. The vehicle's weapon is mounted on an L shaped rail system that allows the gunner to fire straight ahead of the vehicle or to the left. And while this limited movement would normally be deleterious in most tactical situations on other vehicles, the land speeder's anti gravitic propulsion system allows it to quickly turn the entire vehicle towards the gunner's target. There are some Space Marine chapters that use a slightly different non-named pattern of land speeder that is equipped with twin-linked heavy bolters in place of the single one. During the Great Crusade and the Horrors Heresy eras, the land speeder could be equipped with different weapons, such as switching out the heavy bolter for a heavy flamer, or adding another weapon, such as a Havoc missile launcher, another heavy bolter, a plasma can, or a graviton gun. The land speeder of those ancient and more technologically advanced times were also able to be armed with up to two hunter killer missile launchers, each with a single hunter killer missile. Unlike any other Imperial vehicles, the land speeder has no upgrades or attachments that can be equipped. Now, brother, why don't you explain the White Scar's last but not least favorite vehicle, the Thunderhawk? (laughs) Very well. But before I do, I have a quick question that I just thought of while you were talking about the land speeders. Uh, If I recall right, the bikes also use the Meltas, right? Or is that just Um, a land speeder thing? I I don't know why it's in relation to land speeder. I'm just wondering why on earth they would attach a heavy flamer. Well... (laughs) We, I'll we like fry fire. myself. <laughs> they like fire. I, I don't know, but I mean the heavy melta. The thing that I, I I've always I wonder about that is is that you I mean while they're fast they don't have a whole lot of armor to them right right their armor is their speed but to use a heavy melta you literally have to you have to get pretty close don't you um, for a melta well you'd have to be. Much closer than most of the other weapons. Like a bolter or something like that. So yeah, I guess anyways, my question is, why would you actually mount a multi-melta <clears throat> onto one of these things? Because remember, you want to be super fast, so you want to be able to, and you want to keep your distance, right? 
if you're going to attack something. Uh, because maybe. the closer you get to something anyways, the easier it is for them to hit you. So why would you use a multi-melta? That's my question. Okay, so some patterns of land spirits are actually used as transports. Okay. And in that case, yes, maybe because, you know, you maybe drop them off near a, like, tank or something. And so while you're sitting there and having people jump off, you might as well take a shot at the armored vehicle. Okay. Uh, so what you're saying is, is that they're going to drop off their peoples anyways right next to a tank. That doesn't sound like a great strategy. Here you guys go. That That's a tank. Why are we next to a tank? Because <laughs> you have Meltas. <laughs> you have a Melta, a Melta. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'll uh, cover you. <laughs> okay. Well. <laughs> and and it's not necessarily the last vehicle of the White Scars, but we'll get into that. Okay. So so explain about the Thunderhawk. Okay, okay. Now the Thunderhawk gunships are used by the Adeptus Astartes as their primary means of deploying forces, as well as their primary source for air support. The Thunderhawk gunship is often considered the linchpin of any Space Marine chapter, as it is able to fulfill many combat roles. The Thunderhawk is fully capable of functioning as an orbital dropship, a heavy ground attack gunship or even as a bomber, the aircraft is able to quickly carry Space Marine forces from orbiting starships down into the midst of battle, while at the same time providing supporting fire against enemy ground or air targets. Even though the Thunderhawk is a large vehicle, it is controlled with relatively small crew, which includes a tech marine pilot, co-pilot, gunner, and navigator. Now, the Thunderhawk gunship was first developed for service in the Legion of Sestades during the later days of the Emperor's Great Crusade in the final century of the 30th millennium. The Thunderhawk was designed to bridge the gap in size and capacity between the smaller Legion crafts, such as the Storm Eagle, and the larger, much more costly Stormbird and Argo dropships. Now, early on, the Thunderhawk was not popular with some of the Space Marine Legions, as they had grown attached to their Stormbirds and their ability to transport more units into battle than the smaller, more compact Thunderhawk. Yet by the outbreak of the Horus Heresy, the Thunderhawk had proved itself a worthy addition to any Legion's fleet and was mass-produced to meet the ongoing demands of the war. Eventually, the Thunderhawk was widely used by all 18 Legion of Astartes during the Horus Heresy. The craft was produced in such numbers, in fact, that after the war ended and the Loyalist Legions were broken down into smaller chapters, many of the newly formed chapters would find themselves with many Thunderhawks, and only a few, if any, of the larger craft. As a testament to the craft's design and how easy they were to produce, the Thunderhawk has far outlived the Stormbird and Argo drop ships, and is still the main assault craft used by both the Loyalist Astartes and the Traitor Legions of Chaos after nearly 10,000 standard years. The Thunderhawk gunship is amongst the most advanced and technologically sophisticated machines in use by the Imperium. Each and every Thunderhawk is packed with advanced targeting, sensory, communications, avionics, and navigational equipment, all of which is protected by its thick hull. The armor used in the construction of the Thunderhawk is the same as that used in the creation of the Land Raider. This special armor plating is comprised of a composite of ablative ceramite, absorption, and dissipating materials, thermoplast fiber mesh, titanium rolled plates, and an animantium inner hull all layered together to provide excellent shielding against heat during orbital entry and exits and from energy-based weaponry. This armor has given the Thunderhawk a reputation as a very robust craft, and it is capable of taking large amounts of damage while still remaining in the air the aircraft is capable of smashing its way past enemy interceptor craft and anti-air fire and safely landing its cargo of Astartes behind enemy lines or deploying them into the midst of the foe. The Thunderhawk's internal systems are just as robust as its outer protective armor. The vehicle's primary narrow band, long-range communications box transmitter, is situated on top of the aircraft's fuselage and is controlled by the vehicle's navigator and co-pilot. This system, along with its sensor array and electronic countermeasures, is capable of jamming enemy sensors and tracking equipment, making it very difficult for the enemy aircraft to lock onto the aircraft. 
The Thunderhawk's navigational equipment, which allows the craft to easily find its landing coordinates and safely reach its destination, whether it's in space or on the planet's surface, is also capable of relaying data to other space marine forces. If a Thunderhawk is ever shot down during combat, the vehicle will activate its emergency locator beacon, which will start broadcasting its position to the rest of the space marine forces, allowing the quick rescue of any survivors and the recovery of the aircraft itself. The Thunderhawk also features many unusual things. One such is its two attack wings. These small wings are located above the craft's main pair of larger wings. These attack wings are locked down to the main wings during normal flight. But during an attack run, the wings are released, and while they are unlocked, they are able to provide the aircraft with additional directional stability, making the Thunderhawk a very stable strike platform for the accurate engagement of enemy ground forces from the air. While in atmosphere, the Thunderhawk is powered by a triple RX-9200 Mars pattern engine, each of which combines a rocket engine with afterburning, air-breathing turbofans. These engines are mounted on the rear fuselage of the aircraft and under both of its main wings. These engines allow the aircraft to reach atmospheric speeds of upward of 1,200 miles per hour, depending on planetary conditions such as gravity and air pressure. The Thunderhawk is capable of flying in atmosphere faster than the Imperial Navy's Marauder Bomber, yet it is not as fast as the true interceptors such as the Thunderbolt or Lightning Fighters. While the Thunderhawk is in space, its three engines are used as rocket boosters, with the air-breathing turbofan components of the engines isolated from the rest while the hydrogen fuel used by the aircraft's onboard fusion reactor is pumped into the combustion chamber, where it burns to create a highly pressurized, high-velocity stream of gases. These gases flow through the engine-shaped exhaust nozzle. And the forces generated by the gases leaving the engine is able to rapidly propel the craft forwards. The Thunderhawk also features several retro exhaust nozzles that are positioned around the aircraft's hull. And these are used to vent some of the gases from the engines and to control the aircraft's movement while it is in zero gravity. Now, the Thunderhawk may be smaller than the Stormbird it was designed to replace, yet it is still capable of transporting a great deal of cargo. The Thunderhawk can carry up to 30 power-armored Space Marines, or 15 Space Marines in Terminator armor. The craft can also carry vehicles, such as a single Dreadnought, which takes the place of about five normal Space Marines, or a single Assault Bike Squadron, where each Assault Bike takes up the room normally used by three Space Marines. Aha! Uh -huh. This is why White Scars love them so much. <laughs> yes, well, part of it. You see, among all the Emperor's legions, the White Scars were the most enthusiastic adopters of the newer Thunderhawk pattern gunships. Smaller mass-produced replacements for the ancient and vast Stormbird pattern dropship that had served the earliest incarnations of the Legion of Astartes since their department from Terra itself. These vehicles, while less powerful and posing than the huge Stormbirds, were more easily customized by the Gon Khan of the Armory to suit the needs of the White Scars, and far more easily maintained and supplied on the long solitary campaigns favored by the 5th Legion. By the time of the Chondax Crusade, most of the larger brotherhoods of the 5th Legion had been assigned at least a single Thunderhawk, with some fielding enough to transport their entire complement into battle without recourse to more cumbersome landing craft. Integral as they were to the mobile style of warfare and operation favored by the White Scars, these vehicles were the focus of many of the small rituals within the brotherhoods. Upon their armored flanks, they bore the marks of those who lived and died as warriors of the Ordu of Jagatai, serving as shrines for the dead and fortresses for the living. Each bore a name and history, the equal of any other veteran of the Legion, and many enjoyed a fame more widespread among the Legion than the warriors who crewed them. Yet, before we carry on, let me explain how this little craft packs a hell of a punch. The Thunderhawk gunship is capable of carrying a fearsome array of weaponry, depending on which type of mission it has been tasked for, and is able to undertake a wide array of battlefield roles. The basic armament of the Thunderhawk gunship is that of four twin-linked heavy bolters located near the front of the craft's fuselage and under the aircraft's main two wings, two LAS cannons located under the wings, and a dorsal-mounted battle cannon known as a Thunderhawk cannon. The aircraft can also be outfitted with up to six Hellstrike missiles and six triple bomb pylons. 
The aircraft can replace its dorsal-mounted Thunderhawk cannon with a turbo laser destructor for extra firepower. The craft is also capable of carrying large guided bombs with various warheads, which are used during bombing missions. Oh well, brother, what do you think of this fearsome bird? Quiet little maybe um <laughs> a bit of an exaggeration. I mean, if you can fit multiple bikes inside of it, uh <laughs> I think it's because it was significantly smaller than the Stormbird. Yeah, well. I think that's why they keep calling it small. And, and Okay. Yeah, compared to a Stormbird, it is fairly small. But, yeah, it's 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 a flying tank. I mean. <laughs> no, it, it basically is. They, they mentioned that. It, its armor is Land Raider armor. Well, I mean, me personally, I'm a big fan of the Thunderhawk. I kind of like it. It's For a flying tank, it looks fairly streamlined, actually. It it reminds me a lot of Terran 42's hind helicopter. Okay. Does that make sense? I mean, yeah. Don't get me wrong. If you look at a picture of it anyways, I mean, yeah, it's 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 more in 40k, yes, it flies around, but if you if, if you took the rockets off of it and then put, you know, whirly bird <laughs> blades <laughs> on top of it, it looks a lot like a hind. It's like which one though? What do you mean? Which hind? I mean, your standard hind helicopter. I mean, they're all, I mean, you, yes. You realize that there are some hinds that look completely different. Yeah, but they're all, okay, the hind, we don't, we don't have time for this, Eugen. <laughs> they go into the hind helicopter. No, we don't have time for that. But I do believe, anyways, we got time for a story about the white scars. Oh, whoa, whoa. Wait a minute. What about the tanks, like the rhinos, petters, and vindicators? What about the dreadnoughts? Well, white scars really don't use a whole lot of that stuff. I mean, but they, they do, do but use them. They do. They do. Well, <laughs> actually, uh, the dreadnoughts in and of itself is kind of an interesting story. Why, why, why don't you tell the people anyways about what the dreadnoughts do? It's, it's fairly interesting. Uh, first of all, there aren't many of them because of the fact that the mindset of a white scar is I'd rather die than be stuck in a sarcophagus. But um, during the Great Crusade time, basically what they would be is uh, you wouldn't see them really fielded because of the fact that they would be placed on Terra and I think it's actually Chigoris to protect the gene yeah. seeds. Yes, 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 it's Chigoris. Chigoris and Terra. Um, Maybe they had, Unless they had like some visions that the storm seers were able to decipher, then they, that's pretty much where they were the entire time. Yeah, they would, they would sit, they were the guards of the gene seeds. That was pretty much their job. But occasionally one of them would get like a vision that they needed to go somewhere and they would, they would just get up and march there and, and fight alongside the rest of their brothers. Because, I mean, who, what con anyways would go, no, you have to go back to your hole now. Well, there actually were some that did do that. Yeah, it was a rarity. Now, when you're talking about the other tanks and stuff like that, I mean, like you mentioned, it's just kind of, it's got to be able to keep up. And most of the stuff doesn't keep up with bikes okay. and, and land speeders. If you look at a Vindicator, it looks like it would be much slower than the other vehicles mentioned. Well, I mean, the, the reason why I said anyways that they do use tanks and stuff like that is just simply because even regardless if you're using hit-and-run uh, tactics, it's nice to have, you know, a couple <laughs> of heavier units in your squad. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah. There's also, though, a... Brotherhood company, uh, by the way, for we use Brotherhood, they're the same as companies. It's a white scar thing, kind of like how Space Wolves have uh, companies instead of chapters. Have uh, they're called yeah. companies, I think, right? Great, uh, great companies, yeah, hey. yeah, so, yeah. But, anyways, <clears throat> but there's one of them, um, it's the let me look it up. I thought it's right here. The seventh company that um, utilizes and trains them in Storm Talons and uh, what is it? Storm Hawk gunships. Well, right. 
Storm Talon gun ships and Stormhawk interceptors, which are much smaller, much more nimble spacecraft than the Thunderhawks. And in fact, he utilizes them so well, the con there, that he's been named the Skyhawk. Who? Uh, the guy's name was. Is... <laughs> it was like Jacket Tai Khan's known as the Warhawk. <laughs> no, no, this guy, though, is different. <clears throat> ah. Well, while you're looking that up, another reason why the White Scars also have all these tanks and armored vehicles is because they are a Codex Astartes compliant chapter. Right. So that means that they have to set up their, their chapter or their, sorry, brotherhoods the same way anyways that the Codex Astartes dictates it. So that means oh. that you have to have some sort of tanks in your units. And you always have to have at least one land raider. Right. <laughs> but what 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 brotherhood was it again? Uh, you talked about him anyway. It the, was the, the one seventh th company seventh? known as the Plain Stalker Brotherhood, and right. the Khan was known as Olujan Khan, and he is known as the Skyhawk because he basically, when he's on the field, he's able to control the air, basically. Right. <laughs> well, before we take <laughs> okay, so well before we take off. What do you think of the 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 whole ah, fantasy, ah, right? Ah, ah. Ah, ah, I didn't even catch that. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> Before we take off, what what, uh, uh, what 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 do you think, anyways, of these vehicles that we did talk about? Um, and I will just have to hold, anyways, this story that we had for another time. It's a good one, though. The hunt for the shattered prince. Well, I think they all fit with the concept of the white scars basically their war, cry really, hard. <laughs> their war cry really should be pedal faster <laughs> sorry well they are the laughing legion remember <laughs> the happy killers <laughs> yeah. what do they call them again sorry I, I kind of interrupted you there carry on <laughs> what were you saying um it does fit very well with them. They are definitely a mobile unit. They're not like the Imperial Fists, who <laughs> I don't see them really having many bikes. I don't think anybody Uxid has compared the Imperial Fists with the White Scars. <laughs> Other than maybe they're both Space Marines. I think that's about as close as they get. <laughs> yeah, they're basically exact opposites on how you fight whereas the white scars are surgical using things like their bikes and their well they're hunters land speeders and their thinner hawks it's the imperial fists are we build the wall and we protect the wall right <laughs> and then if you guys stop coming we'll build another wall a little bit farther ahead we'll protect that one we will slowly get there the rolling There's... barrage is something anyways the Imperial Fist used to quite the advantage. And but, they're one of the ones that uses, uh, what did they call that? In Terran 42, there's that Roman formation where they'd have Testudo, the line up front with shields, and then people with shields above them so that when they're laying Uxin. siege, they can Uxin. annihilate them. I just said it. Testudo. Testudo? It's okay. Latin for tortoise. Okay. But yes, yeah, and you actually another thing that's kind of interesting about the Imperial Fist is that they use shields. Not all, not all Space Marines <laughs> legions actually use shields or chapters they use shields. But getting back to the White Scars, okay, I do, I do have a question for you. What do you think they prefer? Do you think they prefer the bikes or the land speeders, or do you think uh, it's just kind of like whatever is more tactically appropriate? Overall, more technically appropriate, but um, if they had a choice, I'd assume they'd lean more towards the assault bike because, you know. They're so much cooler. <laughs> well, that plus is just like, okay, the only difference is you're going from something that runs on four legs to something that runs on wheels. <laughs> well, So you've got a little bit more, you know, like you're on the ground. You're, it's it's yeah, more of a it's because it's more of a okay we're just going from one saddle to another so they probably have they would feel more connected with that than they would 
uh, I'm seeing in a tin can with guns. Yeah. Well, not only, I think another thing anyways, that I think that we over, overthink a lot of times anyways, is like, for instance, here, here, let me pull this up. Here is the sound of an attack bike. Here's the sound of a land speeder. <laughs> you see the difference? I think a lot of it has to do with the sound, man. I mean, that's just that that huge chugging that I mean <laughs> it gets me ready to go, you know? <laughs> it's like, all right, we're running. <laughs> Mind you, not all of them can be like that, because I mean they're also used for scouting. It doesn't make sense for them to be extremely loud if you're trying to scout ahead. So they use the crotch rockets for those ones. I mean <laughs> the ones that go Ring. <laughs> And they get laughed at as they go zipping off. I mean, <laughs> it's just, I don't know. Me, me personally, anyways, especially with like Terran 42, I understand anyways, the crotch rocket, the Yamahas, they're super fast and, and they're very maneuverable, but give me an old Harley with that good chugging sound any day of the week. <laughs> to me anyways, that's like perfect. That's <laughs> sunny day. Rolling down the highway at like 50, 60 miles an hour with that chugging sound. Oh, that's 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 freedom right there. That's the, that's perfect. Hey, 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 we aren't advertising. <laughs> but if you want to know more about Harley's, check out this website. No, 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 I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, it's not just Harley, Yamaha also does, you know, like a cruiser and stuff like that, and they do sound significantly like it's got that chugging sound to it, but. Well, no, they all kind of have to sound like that. I mean, because it's going to take a huge engine anyway. <laughs> okay, before we keep going anyways, how on earth did that Space Marine make it through a wall of rock creep <laughs> without losing any speed and not dying? <laughs> he probably had like Meltas or something <laughs> on the front and just shot the wall right before. <laughs> that's why they have that's why they have multi meltas just so they can get through stuff <laughs> it's not because they're attacking anything they're just like we need to go through this wall hit the button Pfft. all right we're through <laughs> oh. and then oh there's a tank right in front of us Frick. hit it again <laughs> hit it again <laughs> crunch well he didn't hit it fast enough steve and now we're dead <laughs> Or it would be <laughs> the bike anyways. He doesn't hit the button fast enough. He goes flying over the top of it. Yeah. Uh, that was another thing, too, is that is very different than, you know, your standard Terran 42 motorcycle. Those tires, I mean, you've seen pictures of them anyways. They're like someone strapped, someone strapped like monster truck tires <laughs> to these bikes, which I know they say anyways that they're very maneuverable and they can do things like that that are, are you know like super quick calculations and changes of movement how are you gonna do that anyways and that those big fat tires and you can't really do what they do with a lot of the japanese cars where you i mean uh motorcycles where you lean really because they have those huge giant pedals that you're standing on <laughs> and now we're back to pedaling <laughs> 
honestly, anyways, I, I do agree with you. I think the the the, the white scars approve more of the bikes. But I do think the land speeders are far more maneuverable when you stop and think about it. I mean, just the concept that you can spin it on a dime, literally spin it on a dime anyways, and then drop right next to somebody is, is fairly impressive. That's why I wish they were actually more jet bikes because they were kind of like a blend between the two that actually worked out fairly well. Except for the fact that they don't really have any armor whatsoever. <laughs> <clears throat> No, no, no. Actually, the front was very well armored because the concept was that you just you gun this thing and you just charge. It was almost like running through people with a chariot. They just bounce off the sides as you keep chugging through. But and another thing that I didn't mention was is that they were actually a lot of times used where a stormbird comes swooping over the top of the battlefield. And I'm assuming the land speeders do kind of the same thing with Thunderhawks. Is that as they're swooping down, anyways, they open up the back, and then the guys on jet bikes, anyways, would just start up their anti gravity and they just go backwards. So it's almost like a bird swallow maneuver, but the opposite direction. So as they're dropping down, anyways, all of a sudden, all these bikes are just kind of dropping out of the back of it and just gunning the engine and start swooping off. Okay. Wherever they need to go, which to me, if I could get a video of that, that would be awesome. <laughs> Just all of a <laughs> there they go. But uh, did the land speeders do that? Probably not, because are they too big to fit in a stormhawk or a thunderhawk? Sorry, um, I think it's more of trying to get them out of the thunderhawk rapidly might be an issue. So actually, more like uh, what you would imagine, anyways. Like if you had a Terran forty two, a C one thirty, and it drops down and it drops its its. I saw this in a movie. <laughs> it, it drops his back hatch and then the car guns it and zips out the back. <laughs> kind of more like that with a uh, land speeder. Uh, I guess. I mean, that would be just the concept of that. Well, with the anti gravic technology on that, could you imagine that? It could drop down and it could go zipping forwards, or it could just literally turn on a dime, swivel, and then just zip off the other direction. The same direction that the Thunderhawk is zipping off of or zipping out on. Just some of the, the, the concepts of the land speeder to me are, are fascinating. With anti gravitic technology, you can literally <laughs> you can be Jewish. You can stop on a dime and pick it up too. I mean <laughs> it's <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, I, just that concept that you have that much control over a vehicle is insane. And yet you say, anyways, that they prefer the, the bikes. And I kind of agree with you. I think that they do prefer the bikes. But, well, okay. So maybe it's this really is just a mechanical steed is what it is. Right. It, it's Okay, so it's, 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 it's just transferring from a horse to a bike as opposed to this weird, I don't know what to do with this thing. <laughs> well, not only that, but land speeders are significantly larger, right? Yes. So you're talking well, like about, I said, some of them actually are used as transports. So yeah, right. they're they're bigger. So that's probably another reason why is because you well, I said that it's got all this cool mobility to it. A bike, on the other hand, you've got one guy on there and he kind of controls whatever he's doing. I understand the, the Codex of Stade says that they have to act as one and flow around and whatnot, but one of the things that's got to be anyways great about these things is, is that you can, if you see something, you can immediately react to it as opposed to, hey, guys, we got to go this way. I just saw something. Just immediately, boom, we're there. Right. Uh, okay. I, <laughs> talking about this stuff. Honestly, I like, I like mechanics and I like vehicles. So this one has actually been kind of fun for me. But what, <laughs> especially if we're talking about bikes. But <laughs> what, what do you think, anyways, when it compares to the white scars? Why do you think that they like this stuff so much? Other than the fact that, you know, obviously they're hunters and they come from hunter stock. And it's and it's kind of their aspect is, is you know, they're mounted warriors. But why do you think that they, they gravitate towards this more than, like, for instance, the rhino? Where you can zip along anyways or... <laughs> And your little rhino, and then everybody pops out the back. Or, or more <laughs> importantly, anyways, why don't they go the way of the uh, the Raven Guard and do more like jump pack stuff? 
So, so why do well, you think jump they pack like stuff this? is just short distance? Right. Well, you know, anyways, the white scars could probably redesign those things, give like some wings or something like that. It's like we're going to fly. <laughs> <laughs> we're not falling with style. We're actually going to fly. <laughs> but sorry, why do you think they really gravitate towards these, in particular, these two? I think part of it has to be the aspect of the speed. Well, generally, they're they're faster than the other vehicles, for one thing. Uh, yes. And some say it's because they have to have the feel of the wind in their hair and all that publicity crap. Which is hard to do when you're wearing a helmet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's why I'm just like... Mm. I think it's... Uh, I. Like you said, anyways, I think a lot of it has to do with they come from they come from uh, horse tribes. I mean, <clears throat> in Terran Forty Two, Mongols knew how to ride a horse before they could walk. This right. is kind of the same concept. So, but they they can't. No one built a better horse. They built a motorcycle. So yeah. <laughs> they're like, cool, we can work with that. And land speeders are more of kind of like their carriage, right? Although. Okay, so I do have I do have another question for you here. Why do you think they prefer, other than obviously the speed, but why do you think they prefer that over a rhino? A rhino is well, you have less control. Right. I, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. <laughs> Although it is slower. A, a rhino, a rhino, you could actually turn on a dime, but it would just be significantly slower. The way that you did it. You'd have to have the treads on one side going one way and one side going the other way. <laughs> and you could right. turn it in 360. But <laughs> to me, the coolest thing about the White Scars is because they run their legion this way. They're fast. They're <laughs> they're fast enough anyways they can put the Drukari on their heels. That kind of fast. <laughs> yeah, they're very maneuverable. But not only that, it's Another thing that I like about their aspect is they go over things to the most minute detail before they take to the field. Well, you have to, right? If, if you're going to remove, anyways, the armor aspect, then you have to know, anyways, where the enemy is and how much their strength is. Yeah, because it goes along back to their predator-hunter aspect, which is you find that one spot that you can strike... They only need to strike like once, and you cut out the enemy's heart. Yeah, yeah. I it, it reminds me actually very much, anyways, on Terran Forty Two, how the U.S. military is set up. It's very set up. I mean, don't get me wrong; they they also like the White Scars have tanks and stuff like that, but their concept is fast mobility. I, I remember someone telling me at one point that the United States military could be in any country, any place at any time within 24 hours with a substantial force. That's what we're talking about here. Somebody anyways, that has lightning strike and has the capability to be anywhere at any time. Right now, mind you anyways, if you can, if, if you can corner the white scars, they're screwed. But if you can corner the white, <laughs> corner the white scars, you are a far better general than I am. As <laughs> good luck with that. With how fast they are. Because more than likely, if you have them quartered, you don't really have them quartered because you only got a piece of them. <laughs> it's like you roll up and, and it was right. their plan, so you get hit from behind. <laughs> it's like you roll up on your tanks, like, aha, we have you surrounded. And all of a sudden, one of them falls over, it's like, no, these are cardboard cutouts. What are the rest of the white scars? And they come in from behind. Um, <laughs> look behind you. Oh. <sighs> Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> and here they come roaring down the hills anyways on their bikes and just destroy you <laughs> well do you have any other comments about going fast is there anything you want to mention about the vehicles i mean i know i talked about the bikes quite a bit and i'm sure that you also enjoy the bikes is there anything you wanted to mention about the bikes in particular um no not really and on that interesting note folks that be it for this week Join us next week as we discuss our favorite subject, Notable Characters! Fantastic! Well, thank you all for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this box. Feel free to like, follow, subscribe, and comment. And don't forget to check out the shop. We got some cool stuff there, like clothes, pillows, and hats. 
And don't forget rabbits, Yuxin. <laughs> I got it this time. <laughs> right. And don't forget the rabbits. Have a great day. And as always, <clears throat> until next time, this is Ekthar. And Yuxin. Signing off.